All right, folks, thanks for tuning in to the uh, Speaker Builder channel. And today we're uh, playing around with bass speakers. Uh, I'm rebuilding my old bass boxes from way back. Finally found some good drivers to put in those. And so replacing these old original ones. Well, actually, I had these in there, but we're going to talk about that. Uh, but I thought this would be a good opportunity, this uh, rebuilding these, to talk all about bass for folks uh, and make the video really just about a bass and bass response and driver size and all of that. So uh, let me start actually with alignment because that's maybe a, a good place to, 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 to start off. Uh, when you're looking at bass drivers, regardless of size, we're, we're, you're looking at a, uh, an alignment. A bass driver, if uh, you're going to produce bass without it being in a box, if it was an infinite baffle and no box to support it, uh, if this driver were to operate at 100 cycles, suppose at a certain amplitude it was moving that much, if you half the frequency, you go down to one octave down to 50 cycles, that amount of movement would have to be quadrupled. So it would have to be, I can't even make this driver do quadruple that. And then down to 25 cycles, it would have to be quadruple that larger uh, throw. So it's really remarkable to me that uh, if you take this kind of a driver that couldn't possibly continually uh, quadruple the, the, the piston movement, uh, cone movement with uh, frequency, with having a frequency, that you can put a, a driver in a box and get flat response. It's kind of a magic. The engineers have figured that out. I'm not an engineer. Uh, I'm just having fun with this stuff. But uh, those guys figured that out, that you put it in a box, you tune it certain ways, you can get a driver to be flat all the way down into nearly 30, 25 cycles. It's, it's really amazing. So that's the idea, to get flat response down as low as possible. And the box helps to do that. So. Let me then talk about the two kinds of box alignments, they're called alignments, uh, uh, and they involve really a sealed box and then a vented box. Now there are other kinds of alignments folks are playing around with, transmission line and all these different kind of things. Excuse me, and I don't have any experience with any of that, so I can't really tell you whether those sound good or what they're all about. I will leave that for others to talk about, but we're going to talk about sealed and vented. So between those two, the sealed alignment is very simple. The uh, base box six, I guess it's version six, will provide an alignment for the various characteristics of a driver, be their, their physical size and the, and the physical and electrical uh, characteristics of a driver. Those will, re will uh, constrain the type of alignment and even the parameters of that alignment. So base box six and uh, other software like that, but that's the main one folks are using. Uh, will will spit out when you put in all that data certain alignments and the two that are primarily being used being looked at are sealed and vented and the sealed alignment has one advantage it requires a smaller generally a smaller box than the vented so that's advantageous for you don't want so big a box and a lot of systems are sealed for that reason you see these gigantic drivers in small relatively small boxes they could be vented but oftentimes they're sealed and they just uh, I don't like the sealed the sound of a sealed system, so I've never utilized that. We're utilizing it in the truck speakers for the various reasons I talk about in the crazy truck speaker projects. I'll talk all about that. But in home settings, the sealed alignment, it has it has a small box, smaller box, but it has a higher F3. Now F3 is the frequency at which uh, the response is beginning to drop and it reaches a 3 dB down, 3 decibels down from its uh, uh, from its nominal uh, uh, amplitude. And so as it begins to drop off, you select a 3 dB down point, and that's the point at which you're practically, your driver's not really doing much after that, below that. So with a sealed alignment, generally, uh, certainly for 10s and for 12s, you're in the 50 cycle, 45 cycle range at F3 before you're getting that drop off. And that's going to really uh, constrain the, the quality of the base that you can get. In my humble opinion, I want to get all the way down to 30, maybe 25. I could get it down to 20 if I could, but no, no, almost no systems out there can get you to 20, but down to 20 in the high 20s. And we'll get that down in the high 20s with these systems. Uh, 10 inch drivers, I can get down in the high 20s. So that's really where you want to go. Sealed systems won't get you there. So often what they'll do is with a sealed system, they'll, they'll use electronic equalization in the amplifier to boost the frequencies below 50 to get you a flat response. So I just don't like the sound of sealed systems and I don't like uh, forcing uh, through amplification uh, a system to, to produce those flat responses. So I want to use the vented alignments or called bass reflex elsewhere 
that produce an F3 that's much lower for a given driver. So, and generally the larger the driver up to about 12 inch gets you a lower uh, resonant uh, system frequency and an F3. Uh, although I have to say the 8 inch system that I have in a vented alignment that's just off camera, this Hi-Vi, these Hi-Vi drivers, and if you go look at the Active Speakers project, you'll see these Hi-Vi drivers. I talk all about those. Those are in a one and a half cubic foot box, which is quite large, and they get an F3 down about 32 cycles. That's amazing, and they sound awesome. I really love these eight-inch drivers. So, uh, if you're gonna, if uh, so, I'm recommending vented alignments first of all, and then I've also, and we'll talk about with them, when I talk about replacing these with these, and I'll get into that about the different sizes of vented alignments. But generally, it's large. Uh, for the size of the driver and I just happened to fall into that when I f built my first my very first high quality anyway system that was properly tuned the Focal 2A 8 inch 2A system I built back in the 80s that I sold to my brother but uh, that system 8 inch driver was put into a one and a half cubic foot box which is a big box for an 8 inch driver you generally don't see that in in uh, production systems in, in hi-fi shops and so forth Nobody wants that big a box. Oh, they see that little driver and they that's such a small driver. Why don't they make a bigger driver? Well, it sounds awesome. That's why. So, and then for a 10 inch driver, I've learned a two cubic foot box is really in the ideal place for, for minimum, I'm talking. Now it could be larger than that, but I've never, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, if you don't, I don't know what the advantage is beyond two cubic foot box for 10 or three, three cubic foot box like this one for a 12. I've never listened to a system beyond that. So I, you know, there are systems like that. How many systems do you build? I've built a lot of systems, but I, my experience is still somewhat limited. So, but three, I mean, I don't want a four cubic foot box if I can get adequate base out of a three. So, and I love the base from these drivers and in this box. I've, I've enjoyed that for years. It sounds great. And those eight inch in this and the larger ones. And then I have heard 10 inch drivers in two cubic foot boxes. I have a pair of those downstairs and they sound great. So all of that says to me, uh, base reflex is the way to go and you need a fairly large box. And I'll say this one other thing that the, the driver um, parameters will constrain the size of the vented box. It dictates the size of the vented box. And so in this case, this we'll, we'll talk about this in just a minute, but it required a two cubic foot box and this one the three. But anyway, I've been used to this one in this three cubic foot box and listened to that for years, loved it, very, very much enjoyed that. And I've heard eight inch drivers in one and a half cubic foot boxes, which is also a very large box for that size driver. And I love those and enjoy the base out of those. So used to that. Let me talk a little bit about whether it's a 10 or a 12. We're going to assume you're going to, if you are interested in the base, you're going to select a 10 inch driver or a 12 inch driver. So this being a 12. Some of the parameters that I look for in a driver, uh, besides the alignment, which I'll talk about in a minute, but a good polypropylene cone, a stiff cone, which this has. The drivers I just bought are actually a paper cone, so it doesn't really matter that much. It's a very high quality cone. The other essential for me is rubber surround, not just because you get a nice uh, F3, F3, F, FS rather, for resonant frequency of the, of, this, of the driver, but the rubber surround lasts forever. These are drivers are 25 years old, and they still sound and they work great. So. If these had been a foam surround, these drivers would be in the trash bin because the foam surround won't survive 20 years. So I don't know if anybody's planning on having drivers that long. And then a couple of the other things for this driver, a 40 ounce magnet, pretty basic for a 10 or a 12. A vented pole, I'd be looking for that. And then uh, this happens to be dual voice coil. So I'll talk just a minute about that in case you run into that and, are, and that is a curiosity for you. Uh, basically, the idea of a dual voice coil is to have a stereo ampli bass amplifier with a right and left channel, and you can wire the right channel to one voice coil and the left channel to the other. That's the idea. I'm going to use this as, well, you could use it as a single sub, or I'm going to actually use this as one channel, and I'm going to have another one over here for the left, for the right channel. So. I've got to wire those voice calls together. And so I'll talk a little, just very, very briefly about that. Suppose my fingers are, uh, if I can do this on the video, suppose my index fingers are the plus and my middle fingers are the, are the minus, then what you're going to do is uh, you've got two options. You can parallel wire these plus to plus, minus to minus. Be sure don't to get that polarity mixed up. Plus and on plus, minus on minus. It, reverse polarity won't work. It just will cancel each other out. Plus on plus, minus on minus, you take, in this case, two 8-ohm loads, and you put them together, you result in a 4-ohm load, a lower impedance, 
lower resistance to the amplifier stage, meaning you get a little bit more power. It just means you have a little more ceiling. If you're running your amplifier right up to clipping and you're getting some distortion at eight ohms and you go to four ohms, you won't get that clipping quite at that point. You'll have to, you have to drive it, you'll get to drive it a little harder before you get clipping. But so does it make any difference eight ohm or four? I, I don't think it's really practically making any difference. But anyway, these, I bought these because it had dual, it was a dual voice coil, I didn't have any option, but they had an eight ohm and a four ohm version. So this 8 ohm version, I was able to wire in parallel and get 4 ohms, and I could load my amp at 4 ohms, and that gave me plenty of power. Alternatively, if this were a 4 ohm version, you might not want to go parallel and, and drive your amp into 2 ohms. You might want to go in series. The series wiring takes the plus of one, hooks it up to the minus of the other. Now you have this one as plus, this one over here is minus, and these are connected together. So this is your plus and minus now for output, for single channel output. That's a series wiring, and your 8 ohm, and your 8, or rather, let's say it's the two 4 ohm uh, voice coils. Your 4 ohms and your 4 ohms together now result in 8 ohms, so you're within that ballpark for your amp. And 8 ohms or 4 ohms, again, I don't think there's much practical difference. It'll sound fine. So that's a little bit about uh, voice coil wiring, just briefly on that. I won't spend any more time on that. So, so, uh, so we put these drivers in these boxes, and I listened to them for a long time, and then I went to rebuild the system. And if you want to look at the rebuilt system, go. I've got a video up there called Top of the Mountain, and it's that active three-way speaker system that I built and, uh, 10, 10 years ago. And I had these drivers in these boxes, and they were buzzing a little bit. They're old. And uh, if you can see in the video, the center dust cap had the glue had all deteriorated. And so I had to cut that glue out cut all the glue off and put uh, b uh, red, uh, black silicone cement on there, cement those back on. They're not exactly perfectly centered, which doesn't matter. They're just a dust cap. They work fine. And that enables them to, to get f some more miles out of these, but uh, they have been repaired and they're, so they're old. So I wanted to replace those. And so I looked at, looked and looked for drivers and I couldn't find anything that's really high quality higher quality than this. In fact, what I ended up buying was the exact same manufacturer. The Eclipse, it's called Eclipse. And it's got the same parameters. It's got the nice poly cone, the rubber surround. It's, it's got a bit different kind of a dust cap on it. It's got the, the I won't, can't tip this on, it's right on his face, but it's got the 40 ounce magnet, vented pole. It's got a screen on the vent, which is cool. Two inch voice coil, it's got all the right stuff. And these are fine. I can really crank the bass in this system and really make it sound great. So the issue though was, and this is important in understanding drivers, uh, Whereas this driver's electrical and, and physical properties called for a three cubic foot vented alignment. This one, on the other hand, being it's the same manufacturer, but it had different characteristics, it called for a two cubic foot box vented alignment. Where the basically, the basically the F3 was at about the same, or close to it, to these. I didn't think anything of that. I didn't think that it would make any difference. I thought these would work fine built brand new boxes, well, at that time, five-sided boxes, but I did it again. I had not built big boxes again until those, and so I thought it'd give me another chance to build the five-sided boxes and do a good job, and I really was pleased with the way they came out. So I had those set up, had these drivers in there, and listened to them, and oh my gosh, it sounded terrible. The bass just was not there. Anything close to the bass of these drivers and these boxes. So I learned a very hard lesson from all that work, and that is something that I had just accidentally been running into, dealing with. As I mentioned, the 8-inch driver was in a 1.5 cubic foot box. That's a really big box for vented alignment for, and these 12s were in this 3 cubic foot box. I didn't realize that the size of the box mattered that much. And so when you get, when I took an 12-inch driver and I went down into a 2 cubic foot box, even though that was properly aligned with a proper vent, and uh, properly tuned, it just didn't have that response at all. So uh, I have learned from that very hard lesson 10 years ago that uh, the size of the box matters a lot. Even though uh, it was a vented alignment and this driver had a proper vented alignment, but because of its parameters, it required a two cubic foot box for the proper alignment. So what I do now when I select drivers is I avoid, uh, if it's a 12 inch driver, I avoid any driver selection that will require a smaller box. Uh, 
So here's another story, here's another piece of that story. I've decided I could take these drivers and I can stuff them into these three cubic foot boxes. I called Matasound. I had them punch in the data uh, for a three cubic foot box for these. You can do that. I did get away with that. They did sound okay. They sounded pretty good. But it's not a proper alignment. So I've really uh, wanted for some time now to buy a, find a, a set of 12-inch uh, drivers that called for a 3 cubic foot alignment of uh, internal volume size uh, and uh, hadn't been able to find any that really uh, suited me or that I could afford or that I thought it would be reasonable. And just found some last week. I discovered I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, so how did these perform in a 3 cubic foot box? A lot better than they did in the 2 but I don't think that they're properly aligned. You've, you, I've went, gone way outside the, the alignment. If you want to stretch out the alignment by, five, by 10 or 20 percent, you know, go from 2 cubic feet to 2.2 or something, you can get into that. That's 10 percent or, you know, I think 2.2 is 10 percent. But you can get into that, but you can't go all the way to 3 and, and have the same characteristics of the driver. There's a reason why the alignment is is calls for the two cubic foot box. That's properly aligned. It just turns out two cubic feet is just too small on a box, even though that's aligned. There's, I don't know if that makes sense because it's, it's it's been a curious thing to me. I see I see vented alignments where it calls for a 10 cubic feet is crazy. So uh, there's all kind of alignments because and the, and the constraints have to do with the electrical and physical properties of the driver. So I now when I choose a driver, if it's t if it's a 12 inch driver, and I'm going to do a vented alignment, I insist on the alignment calling for a three cubic foot or more uh, box size. It's got a th three is minimum for me now. And for a 10 inch driver, two would be minimum. So what I did with those two, I took these out of those two cubic foot boxes. I found a pair of 10 inch drivers that called for a two cubic foot vented alignment, put those in those boxes, they sound great. So I just, just confirmed for me this idea that a large box for vented alignment is really key to get those characteristics that I'm looking for. So. So let's go ahead and look at the drivers that I did find for my, my boxes for this, for this rebuild today. So again, I'm looking online to at drivers that will require, a, a 12 inch drivers that will require a three cubic foot uh, vented alignment. And so uh, when I originally looked at these are SB drivers. I've been playing with and using, I'm utilizing SB drivers now for quite some time and a number of projects over the past couple of years. I absolutely love the design and, and manufacture attention to detail and so forth of the uh, SB drivers. They're wonderful. I love them. So I, I, I was confident that their base drivers that they made would be super high quality and I'm super impressed with these. They're amazing. But uh, So, and again, I was looking for something that would be, that would call for a large box. So when I originally saw these SB drivers, and I was choking at the price, they're very expensive, but uh, I thought someday I would spend the money on that. And they called for the original ones, the brothers of these actually, they're ex almost exactly like them, but the parameters are a little different, and the requirement calls for, in regards to a base reflex or vented alignment, a four cubic foot box. So I can't use my boxes, I'd have to build new ones, because these would be much too small. And that, and that held me back, because I, I, to build new boxes is a lot of work. And to build four cubic foot boxes, they're awfully big. These are already ridiculously monstrous. So I was reluctant to, uh, to take that project on. So I just kind of let it go and didn't bother thinking about it. And then after I did this video on this speaker system, the rest of the speaker system that these base boxes uh, belong to, and that video is called Top of the Mountain. Go take a look at those. And I talk about these boxes and these base drivers that are in there. And my, my goal eventually replacing the drivers. Uh, after I did that video, I went back to Metasound and I looked at the drivers and I salivated over the brothers with these. And then I saw these virtual twins, or just brothers of the other ones, didn't have an alignment. So I uh, emailed Brian and said at Metasound and said, what's the alignment for these? And he came back and said, oh, we can vent an alignment 2.8 to 3.5 cubic feet. And I got all excited because I can use these drivers in these boxes. I don't have to build new boxes, at least not now. I can later on do that if I want. But at least I can, with a relatively little bit of work, I can get these drivers in these boxes. So that's really exciting. So that's cool. Now, a couple of uh, months, maybe six months ago, I was doing the Crazy Truck Speaker, the original Crazy Truck Speaker project. And my original intention was to build a vented 
uh, alignment for those for that system. And then I've learned, and I talk about it in that video, that a sealed alignment is more appropriate for the vehicle. But originally we bought the 10-inch version of these. And the guy brought it here. I was doing that project for a friend. And he brought the driver here. And oh my gosh, I got to take a look at that 10-inch driver. And they were like these. And they're just outrageous. So uh, I got a chance to look at those. So I really started to salivate over getting the 12s. And then when I discovered the alignment was available, that's really awesome. So this has some really cool features to it. Uh, this is a paper cone, which is, uh, I, I've always been uh, prefer preferred a, paper, uh, a polypropylene cone, but uh, the paper cone's perfectly fine. This is going to be indoors. It's not going to be subject to weather and humidity and all that, so that's fine. It's hyperbolic, means it's got that curve to it. I guess you can really see that in the video in the shadow, that it's, this curve is here. That's really cool. Rubber surround, of course, essential. This is a very, very heavy, large cast frame. In fact, the frame is quite a bit larger. I don't know if I'll, I'll try to do this. Uh, take my original, one of my original 12-inch drivers and put it on there. And if you can see, if I line up on this end, look how much bigger the frame is than for this driver versus that. Yet they're both 12-inch. In fact, the cone actually, the cone rubber, to, if you go end to end uh, for the rubber surround and you measure here and you measure there and they're the same size. So it's just a bigger, bigger frame. It's a much heavier frame is all. So it was tough to fit into these boxes. In fact, the, uh, the driver was going to sit out a little bit over the edge. I had to recut these holes. That's one problem. And then the driver's actually going to sit out just a little bit above or beyond the edge of these. So they don't exactly fit, but we'll make it work. And so on the back side, we look at these and we find a a uh, magnet that's absolutely monstrous. It's awesome. So that, as opposed to the 40 ounce magnet of these drivers, and I should probably turn that over and we can look at those. This, this magnet is incredibly, incredibly large, almost twice the size. It's 75 ounces as opposed to 40, almost twice. And it's got a gigantic vented pole in the back here, which is really awesome. And the other really impressive thing about these is the three-inch voice coil. You uh, might not be able to see that in the video, but it's got a, you can actually see the voice coil from, the, from, from here. But three-inch voice coil is really, really good. So this is a truly a high-end uh, driver, uh, if you want to compare, just for fun, the magnet of a 40-ounce magnet against the 75. I don't know if you could see that difference. It may not be so impressive, I guess, in the video, but it's much, much, much heavier. Much, much, uh, much more impressive. And the uh, and Brian tells me that this driver can produce 200 watts and still be within X-Max. And X-Max is the maximum throw top to bottom. And that's basically your, your the top limit of, uh, of uh, sound pressure or amplitude that you can produce with this driver. And so uh, to produce, be able to produce 200 watts and still be with an X-Max means that you've, you've still got a little room to go. So it's like really amazing how much power you can get out of these. Not that I'll probably be producing that much power. I'm really interested in high quality bass response at all volume levels. So that's the idea behind these. And this system, I've got so much money and so much uh, invested in the, the, the uh, top of the mountain system. And I just never had quality drivers. I had very, very mediocre quality bass drivers in it. So that was the idea behind these. So uh, let me talk about the vent a little bit, and then we're going to talk about speaker wire. So when I originally built these, I was putting a vent. This is the actual vent that I started out with in this box, and uh, it's just PVC pipe, and that's an easy, cheap way to do it, by the way. If you don't want to spend the money on these, I'll talk about these in a second, but these are just PVC, and I cut the hole precisely this right size so that this would press fit in there using a hole cutter. But anyway, I had the vent in front here, and I've since learned that was way back 25 years ago. And I've since learned the vent doesn't belong up front. And the reason why is because the, 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 the vented uh, sound coming out of the port can, or, and the risk is that it will be out of phase with the sound of the driver. And so you don't want information very close being out of phase. That would be cause cancellation. It's not, it always sounded good to my ears, but it doesn't belong out there. It's not the right way. So the vent belongs in back of the box. So uh, now the uh, modern way of doing vents is to utilize what's called a flared port. And I hope you can see that in the video. If I shine the light on that in various angles, you can see this is a flared. It's a, got a, uh, an angle to the front of it. And the flared port eliminates some of the noise. The air doesn't come out and then all of a sudden come into free air. So uh, the way to go for, uh, and then you flare the back 
which is also, you can just flare the front, but they also recommend flaring the back of the port so that you have a port like this where it's flared on the front and then you've got a flaring on the back. And then you adjust the length, and I've got already cut my piece here so that the length of this is now correct. And that's, that's going to go into the back of this box. And now the other thing about this is that uh, when you flare the ports, the uh, uh, alignment parameters call for a certain port length, and this is 3 inches, and then it, the length is 12. And so what you, you for flared ports, you add 1 inch. So now we're up to 13. So it's a 13 from, from edge to edge, you've got 13 inches. That's the idea. So and that's all ready to go. And the, cool, the other cool thing about this is you can probably see that the... Uh, that the back is not the same diameter as the front. I don't know if you can see that. But the back's not the same diameter as the front. In the other words, you cut a hole for this, and then this will stick inside that hole. Uh, you don't have to assemble this in, from, from inside the box. You cut a single hole, and this will go into that hole, and then you'll have mounting surface. So that's how it works. Uh, they're not very much money, by the way. It's, it's, if you're going to do it right, go with, go with a uh, flared port. Now let's talk about wire, and to do that I'm going to have to focus in real close in on this wire. So now this, this is unique wire. I hope most of it's in focus here. This is Mogami wire, and I'm, I'm going to talk all about this, and unfortunately, and then I have to tell you that I can't find this anymore. So, uh, so that's perhaps unfortunate, but Mogami made this really interesting speaker wire. Now what we learn in, uh, in electronics is that Electrons tend to travel around the outside strands of any wire. It's called the skin effect. So uh, one of the ways around that, and there are multiple uh, approaches to try to deal with that, one of the ways is to have a coaxial design so that the wire is wrapped in a circular fashion around a, a, a piece of material uh, so that you only have outside wire. You don't have any center core wire. So that's what they did with this coax wire, but the, what they did here is a really neat design. They coax both the outer and the inner, so both of these are coaxial. So that is, there's a larger coaxial on the, if you say, the larger coaxial strands on the outside here that come out, and I've strapped them together into a single core in the black. That's that I put insulation on that black. And then the inner one is also coaxial going around a center core, and I've stripped that down or cut that cut that center core out, and I have the wire there. So now you have coaxial outside and coaxial inside. That's really cool. Uh, but then, of course, the wiring, there's not as, I don't believe there's the same amount of wire in each case. Uh, and certainly it's not balanced any way you slice it because you've got an inner core and an outer core. And the idea of speaker lines, and it's true with uh, input lines as well, you want to have a balanced line. You want to have the same amount of wire, the same kind of configuration of that wire on the plus side and on the minus side. So one of the workarounds to create a balanced line for this is to take two of these instead of one, and you put them together. And of course, you have to cross them, as, I've, as you see, so that the, uh, so this is the center core for one, and then I need the, uh, the, the outside, outside coax that's stranded into a single core here. And those are connected together, and that's going to be either plus or minus, and then the same thing happens here. You have this, this center core coaxial and the outer core coaxial, uh, uh, which is protected with a, with a insulation, with a shrink tubing, and it comes and connects for the minus. And so now it's a truly balanced line. So that's how we do that. Very esoteric stuff. I, I did find later on a similar material it has a coax outside and then a center core wire. But for the for those those two cubic foot boxes for the 10 inch drivers downstairs. And what I do is, again, I do a balanced line. So you, one is coax and core, and you just swap them out so you get plus and minus. Now I'll have to sort of check with the meter which one's plus and minus here and mark it on the, uh, on the other end. But So that's, the, that's a bit about the wiring. So I'm now ready to uh, put this all together, put these, uh, wire these drivers up, bolt them in, put my uh, ports in, and then I can listen to these. Uh, hopefully to get that done tonight. And, so, uh, and then I'll take a couple of weeks and uh, listen to these. I don't ever want to uh, be hasty about my uh, uh, assessment of a system. I always have to listen for quite a while, I listen to various kinds of music over a period of time. And I'll get a good real sense of uh, how these drivers are performing. So I'll come back in a couple of weeks. I'll turn the video camera back on and we'll just do a review of how these sound. And so here are the drivers installed in the boxes now and uh, they've been 
put back in place back in the Triumph system. Uh, if you want a review of this system, go to the uh, top of the mountain video and that reviews uh, the, this entire system, what it's all about. So you can look at that. But uh, here are these drivers are now. I've had been listening to these now for a couple of weeks. And uh, unfortunately, I heard initially uh, a boominess in, in the bottom end that uh, indicated a misalignment. And so uh, I grappled with the, what to do about that. And I had in the past with those uh, Eclipse drivers, the original ones that I showed you earlier in the video, I had actually hand-tuned those by uh, measuring the resonant frequency of the drivers, calling back the supplier Mata Sound, and getting a new uh, system frequency called FB, and then tuning the, lengthening the duct according to the new FB. And so uh, that was kind of the, what was gonna need to be happening here. I was gonna have to adjust the length of the tube of the, of the vent. So uh, what Brian at Mattisound suggested, rather than go through all the trouble of measuring, just listen by ear and adjust the length of this by uh, two inches either way. And so I started, I had to pull the boxes out in front of the system here so I could get at the tubes because you can, you can easily unbolt these. And so I had to adjust the length. I adjusted it, uh, shortened it by two inches and listened to compared to the other one, went back and forth, used my real-time analyzer as well to assess whether the, uh, I could actually see the boominess, see a, a spike, and I did. I was able to see a spike at about 60 cycles. And uh, so as I adjusted it and shortened it, that didn't help. It actually made it a little worse, and then I lengthened it, and the lengthening of it uh, did help, and then I ended up lengthening it about four inches. So they're considerably longer than they were. They originally were targeted for 12 inches. Uh, I was going 13 because of the flared ports. So we ended up at 13 and 4 is 17 inches, so um, that's quite long for these, but they do sound terrific now. So that is, a, that is a, unfortunately a process I had to go through with these that I have not had to do with other drivers that I've purchased from Mattisound for bass with the, with the vented alignments. The 8-inch uh, 2A system, for example, the active speakers, those I simply used the tuning length that was and, and, and diameter that was re recommended by... Uh, by Mattisano, that worked out wonderful. They sound terrific. In fact, that system I mentioned earlier was the model for what real good bass should sound like, and so that's what I kind of was after here. Again, of course, a 10-inch driver sounds very different character than an 8, and a 12 sounds very different than a 10, and so each driver has its own kind of characteristic bass uh, character to it, even though they might all out operate down to about the, low, the same low frequency of around 30 cycles. But... So, so these are now really remarkably wonderful now that they're tuned properly. And so I'm not sure I can uh, recommend other, other than just going with what uh, the folks at Mattisound might suggest as I've done here. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind when you're, and you're dealing with bass speakers in a room is that uh, with low frequencies, when you're getting down to 100 cycles, Say in 110 cycles, the length of the wave at 100 cycles is about 10 feet, and that's the distance from the back wall, or the front wall, I should say, of the, of the house to my back wall, about where the camera is. And then uh, at about 50, 56 cycles, the length of the wave is, uh, is about 20 feet, or they're gonna be the width of this room. And then, of course, you get down into 28 cycles, and you're at 40 feet length for a single wave. So uh, that's, those really long waves are going to produce uh, some issues in a, in a, in a moderate-sized room like this with uh, some, some boominess, perhaps, or some, uh, some peaks and valleys in the response. Remarkably, if I set the microphone about where my hand is in the camera, I'm getting pretty flat response. I'm using a, a, a RAIN real-time analyzer in, with 31 bands, and it just has a, a five LEDs each band, and you, get it, you set the sensitivity to about the middle, and then you'll get, uh, you can set it at 3 dB sensitivity, and so one light above or below is 3 dB difference. So you're, you're using a pink noise to uh, produce this random noise, full range. And then, I'm not gonna set that up to show you, but uh, it's full range uh, noise, just it, it highs, mids, and lows. And so then with a microphone set about here, you measure at, at along 31 bands the uh, amplitude of the frequencies, and you can see nulls or, or uh, peaks or whatever. This had a null back here, about where my hand is, but a little bit to my right. There was a, a null about 250 cycles, and then as I went forward, that 250 cycle null disappeared. 
and so uh, this uh, the the response is sensitive to the position of the microphone. That's always true because you're getting reflections off the walls. So difficult to use a real-time analyzer or a device like that to even if you had a a single tone generator that you could generate various tones and measure the amplitude with a sound level meter or something, uh, which would be a much cheaper way to do than the $500 rain, but uh, uh, and you could do it one, one band at a time instead of all of them at once. But you're still going to get peaks and valleys and it's a matter of the room, not a matter so much of the system. So getting a system tuned by ear, tuning it by ear is a, is a, is a, a tricky process and it's uh, uh, simply a matter of this system may be tuned actually for this room and it might not be properly tuned for a different room. I would not have a chance to try that out unless I were to move somewhere at some point. So uh, at this point though, the system does sound wonderful and that all is all that really matters. So uh, what else do I wanna say? I wanna say one other thing about this system that I did not share. So this is sort of an addendum if you've watched the uh, uh, Top of the Mountains uh, video. I outlined this system uh, pretty much in length as far as what's the details of what it's made up of. But one of the things I would say, there is a document, I should put that up on uh, 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 Mattis, uh, rather, uh, Phil Marchand, who, who made the uh, electronic cross over here. He has a link to a guy who put, put a page on the, on the web that outlines all the advantages of a active speaker system as opposed to passive. And so uh, one of the advantages, I'm not sure he mentions, but that I've learned, and I'll just sort of add this, if you've watched Top of the Mountain video and you wanna, this is kind of an addendum to that, but they, the system, when it's active, as opposed to passive, those passive crossover parts sitting between the output of the, of the amplifier and the driver act as a buffer. And so when a dynamic, and I'm gonna talk about you know, instantaneous dynamics, uh, a snare drum, for example, that goes pop, or a uh, or a horn a horn player that'll hit a note and it'll go bang, or in what are the ways that the uh, the engineer the uh, the artist will produce moment by moment dynamics in a recording? Those dynamics can be hampered by passive crossovers. The speakers are actually insulated from those instantaneous uh, voltage spikes coming from the amp and so the spike comes and tries to hit the driver and get the driver to pop at you to get that dynamic and it's buffered by those electro those passive crossover parts and so there's not as much dynamic uh, uh, experience listening to music with a passive crossover system and that was the big surprise here 10 years ago when I put this together and I began listening I heard that I didn't really recognize it and for a couple of weeks I began to realize the dynamic the system just has a pop to it, it when music comes out, it loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft is really remarkably superior to anything I'd listened to before with uh, passive crossovers. So a little addendum for, the, uh, for this top of the mountain system. And that's why I'm building all uh, active systems. And my next project coming up will be a uh, inexpensive, very affordable uh, active three-way system, two satellites and a single sub. So look for that. In the future, this is uh, uh, heading into uh, spring of uh, 2016, so probably by the summer before that, I'll have that next video out. So that is it for this review of these uh, bass speakers. They are wonderful. They are a lot of money, and that kind of is key here to getting good sound. You just have, you just have to spend a lot of money. I guess that's the only way to do it. Okay, so that's it. I'll see you all next time.